Hi, Rich. How are you? Um, Khalid. Are you there? Yako, can you hear me? I could, can. Let me ask you, like, um, who... The, the two community members that did not come last week, did they confirm this week they're coming? Do you know, do we have a final list of who's on the committee? They actually did not respond. No, we, we did send the notice to them to please confirm that they will be attending moving forward. They did not respond. Uh, if you would so, like to revise the list that I last gave you, we can do so. So send, send me a list please now without them. Okay. Good evening, everyone. This is Kyrie. Ky who is this? Mr. Lane, how are you doing? He's one of the board members, Yako. He's a new board member. Good, thank you. How are you? Thank I didn't catch your name. Kyrie Aline. Nice to meet you, Kyrie. Nice to meet you too. And Rich. And then, Hello. And I'm I'm assuming this is Mr. Richard Rayfield for D Avenue LLC under the name Richard. You're muted, sir. One second, it's much better? Yes, we can hear you. Great, that's my alarm going off just so I don't miss this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> right on time. <laughs> All right. So I, I just want to say hello again. So I'm Kyrie. Um, I'm a new board member here. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. And Richard, you as well, and Rich. I am also a board member, yes. Okay. So Richard is here from the Avenue LLC. Okay. I mean, Richard, you're all, it's your establishment? Yes, it is. And Richard works with you? No, no, I'm the Richard in this, in oh, this oh, yeah, and oh. in in, on top of you. I'm the Richard on top. Richard Raphael is the name. Okay, hey, Richard. Hi, guys. So, the so you're going to be doing business as the Westburn Inn. Yeah, this is this establishment is about this is my my third renewal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've been there about seven years now, give or take. I would give another few minutes see if anybody else comes on. Um, Khalid, we have a few more reservations, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Richard, how is business? Um, it's getting better. Um, the the vaccination um, laws by the New York City has stifled business again, believe it or not. In, 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 in that area, I'm pretty shocked that probably 30 to 35% of my clientele is not vaccinated. Really? Yeah, that's a big shocker to me. Um, well, Brown Heights is actually only like 40% vaccinated, so it's... Oh, okay, so that, 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 that makes sense now to me. Yeah, the district, we're a very low district here of vaccination. Yeah, so that makes sense. So there's been a dip again, um, revenue-wise, um, mm -hmm. since that came out. Rashida, welcome, welcome. Oh, who's 347-971-0241? Karen from the DA's office. Good night, everyone. Hey, good evening, Karen. Yeah. How are you? I'm so happy you joined us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Great. So, um, uh, Khalid, are we expecting anybody else? Hey, Yaakov. I am not entirely sure, actually, at this point. Uh, and I'm trying, I'm trying to access my email. I'm having a difficult time since so I can view the calendar to see who's right. accepted. I so. think um, Tessa said she was coming also, right? Yes, she actually did. She did say that because we sent the reminders to her. Um, hopefully, she'll be able to log in and no issues. All right, so let's give it um, another two, three minutes and then we'll start. Okay. Okay. Karen, you know, I was, um, I was, you know, the, the DA recently got a conviction in a local hate crime. And I know that it's common that people criticize the district attorney's office for not following through, but it's not often that people actually say thank you for following through. 
and especially because this case was so high profile, I think I, the, the DA's office did a good job at following through and, and, and getting a conviction on a hate crime, which, um, you know, many people didn't expect um, the DA to follow through on this, on this, on this uh, case. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. You're welcome. I will let him know. Yes, thank you. You were talking about the vaccine just now. Right. Uh, if you get the first shot, you don't get to the second shot. What happens? Richard, that question's for you. You are allowed to get in with the first shot only. You're allowed access oh. with the first shot. It doesn't have to be both shots. As long as you could show a vaccination card with at least one shot, you're allowed mm -hmm. access. Um, if you're not vaccinated, you could be in an outdoor space only, but that's very tricky because the bar, you have to walk through the patrons to get to the backyard and then come back into order. So that's why it becomes very difficult to monitor somebody who's outside, who's actually coming back in because they saw their friends, they saw their family, um, and then they become an inside patron. That's it. So it's oh. a little expensive. <laughs> to hire somebody to kind of monitor and, 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 you know, like security, especially like on a weekend, just to check vaccination cards. You know, it's extra, it's, extra, it's somebody you have to hire that's extra just to check at the entrance. So you can, you know, if you have, a, especially if you have a zero tolerance policy in terms of letting people in, it's very hard to police people inside and out of the space. So we actually had a conference call this week with, um, the city and some of the health department people, you know, we, it was addressed to the serious lack of trust in, in, in the health department and government today and how to um, deal with the fact that people are scared to get vaccinated. How, what strategy to use? How do you communicate that it's safe and what's the best way forward? And I made the case that the, the city has to listen to the people a little bit more and start to recognize that yes, there's conspiracy theories, and but there are also some valid um, viewpoints out there that the city is not taking into consideration. For example, um, if somebody was sick already and they have high antibodies, that serves some type of immunity. Science, this is science. And if the city mm -hmm. doesn't recognize that, then people stop, you know, stop trusting. Science has to be across the board. It can't just be when it fits your narrative. And I think that we're at a point now, in my opinion, that unless the city changes their communication style, what's going to happen is we're empowering the anti-vaxxers and this is going to trickle into other vaccines. I think that we're, we're creating a, a lack of trust in the medical establishment, which could trickle into other areas of, of, of medicine and other vaccines. And I really think it's, it's critical to control the situation before, before we uh, do damage. But I Googled um, Congress, and I see that they are exempt, and their staff is exempt from the vaccine. Wait, who is speaking no. now? Karen. Karen. Karen, Karen it's, a, it's yeah. a good point you're making, Karen. But the, the reason why, it's not that Congress is an ex exempt. The way government's established, Congre Congress is not subject to presidential orders. That's my understanding. So the president does not have the power legally to force Congress to get vaccinated. Just the way the country was set up with the separation of powers, the Congress is not under the presidential order. So it's not that they're exempt, it's just that when Biden, when President Biden signs an order, it would not apply to Congress. I don't know that that's something they could really, it's not, it's not that they were intentionally exempt, it just uh, happened as a result of how the country is set up. So we should have a separation oh. of powers and one person shouldn't control the whole country. Oh, I see, that's, I see. That's my understanding. If somebody uh, understands otherwise, feel free to correct me. I think we should start the meeting, even though I don't know we have quorum, and I know that some other people said they were coming. Um, I want to open up with Richard. First of all, welcome back, everybody. Um, I see we have two new uh, members to the committee that were not um, here in the past. I mean, they were here in the past. They were not here last year. I want to ask uh, Rich and... and um, K.A., you said it's Carrie, your name is? Yes, so good evening, everyone. I'm Kyrie Aline. Yeah, and please introduce yourself, say maybe 30 seconds about yourself, and then we'll go on to, the, to, the, to Richard. Okay, awesome. So I am Kyrie Aline. I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, born and raised here 
in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Um, the only time I haven't lived here is when I attended school in Washington, D.C. I love to play tennis, volunteer in my community and around the world. And I'm also an, an author, a, a published author. Oh, well, what do you, what, 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 what do you, what's the topics you're published on? Okay, so my book is called Innovative Thoughts, Change the Way You Think to Usher in the Change You Seek. And it's inspirational poetry, motivational quotes, and the self-enhancement journal. And I share to the world the Anyway Initiative, an initiative developed to inspire, enhance, and motivate the any you to believing anyway, loving anyway, and shining anyway. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So it's a it's an honor to be here on the board and also for my community, my neighborhood, and um, actually have visited Richard's establishment before too. So it's pretty All right, uh, cool. Mm -hmm. That's cool. But I do have some questions from reviewing your application. So when the meeting does. Sure. And I do have some. Great. So, so, so uh, Rich, you want to introduce yourself, Rich Heller? Sure. Sure. My name is Rich Heller. I've been a uh, Brooklyn resident for 22 years. Uh, I live in Lefferts Gardens now and uh, happy to be part of the uh, the board here and and, and see what, you, what, what we can do to uh, make things, uh, you know, improve, improve the neighborhoods. Thank you so much. Uh, a the real world. estate professional and um, and construction executive, and I work in the city. And um, I believe in the neighborhood. I believe in Brooklyn. Thank you so much. I see we have Tessa. We definitely have quorum now, which is great. Tessa, welcome. Um, so Richard, we're, we're now going to open the meeting, and I just want to, by way of introduction, I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware. But um, you're up for renewal, and a um, we got a uh, report from the police department about your establishments. Yep. We sent out to all the committee members today, and I recognize that much of what potentially happened has nothing to do with you, but but there are some concerns I think we want to address. So when you when you give us a, a brief overview of the establishment, you could maybe also address. I mean, there were some incidents that happened over the last two years in that establishment and just if you could address what they were and if anything's being done to prevent it going forward. I also wanna recognize that, um, as you said before, the pandemic was a, we had a devastating role on businesses in the neighborhood. And especially now with the vaccine mandate, I understand that you know businesses like yours that hung around and um, really stuck through it and tried to service the community safely and professionally suffered the most. So we, we, we owe you a debt of gratitude for trying your best, but this committee are, and I, also legally, you're not required to come before us and get our support. It's just you know, recommended. And I, I recognize the fact that you're, you're, you're coming before us. And, and I recognize that some of the concerns with your establishment may have nothing to do with you. I also wanna ask before I turn over the floor to you, I have something to discuss after your presentation. And okay. I'd love your input if you can hang around afterwards and not leave yeah, right yeah. afterwards. So sure. Richard, it's all yours. So uh, Richard Raphael is the name. Good night, everybody. Um, I've been at the Westbury, the Avenue LLC slash the Westbury, and uh, this is actually my third renewal. So probably about six years now. Um, probably one of the few bars that were actually on Flatbush probably six or seven years ago. Um, normally, when I do this presentation, I actually have a PowerPoint that I can actually share with you guys in terms of walking it through where we were and pretty much where we are today in terms of incidents and. Um, you know, what we, what we plan to do pretty much going forward. West Bay Rating is pretty much, I would say, a local dive bar. We do have a brief menu on there of like, you know, wings and fries and burgers and, and those small things. But we have a very, um, I would say, a core group that actually, you know, frequents the spot pretty much, I would say, you know, three to four days per week. So very core audience on there. Um, so it's pretty much a lot of beers, a lot of bourbons, you know, pretty stuff like that. I mean, people go there, they play games. Connect Four is actually, the, you know, the most popular games there. There is a backyard um, that's actually available um, today. So we've kind of ran through the pandemic barely, um, especially being a bar that our revenues are flipped. Actually, there's more liquor than food. So actually going to a delivery model was kind of a non-starter for us during the pandemic. So we pretty much had to close most of that time and pretty much survive pretty much of the PPP money and stuff like that. Um, so that's pretty much us going forward, but also developing that kitchen plan a little bit more to become more delivery friendly or takeout friendly, which is very, very hard because we pretty much started off as a bar 
with food as a contingent just to have people eating based on the SLA law, right? Um, so that's pretty much where we are today. I understand you have the police report in front of you. Unfortunately, I didn't get that to answer most of those incidents. And that's what I would have done on this particular call. Um, so what I normally do is I would actually create a PowerPoint and I would actually go over all these line items. Being there six years and coming, coming to you guys probably the second time I've been doing this one for the public review, um, I, um, a lot of incidents that are actually reported, they could get reported at 673 Flatbush even when we're closed. If there's an incident on Flatbush, they take the address, the report, and you get tagged at the bar with it. So if you do share the report with me or have questions about it, I might not be able to answer most of them today because I haven't reviewed the police report that you got. But that's how, that, that's how I normally do it from a presentation perspective. Right. right. So most of these actually incidents were in, I, I would, I, on 11, 2018, um, there was a, a purse stolen inside the establishment. I understand that it's not really your fault. Um, on 3, 2019, somebody heavily intoxicated, suffered head injuries and a torn upper lip. Bartender at establishment stated that the, 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 the aided was hitting his head on a metal gate. Grand Larceny 3 on 3, 2020, also backpack. Um, and 5, 2021 was an assault and a fight with an unknown perpetrator while inside the bar. And he hit him over the head with a, head, with a, with a bottle of beer. I'm aware the of- The last one was not in your establishment. 6, 2021 was a, a car in front. Right. So- so, so let me address the last incident that we had before. Um, I have security cameras. I do work, um, I used to work heavily with um, Vincent Martinez, who recently retired. Um, I've been working with him for six years plus from the community affairs. So there is cameras. I could present the tapes for all of these incidents that actually happened. Um, NYPD does have the tape. They choose not to press charges for assault. That's not up to me. So when something happens in a bar, NYP, and there's a report that files, and if there is a criminal complaint, I would expect the NYP to come to me. I would provide them to take in terms of what actually happens. What happens a lot is if somebody comes in that's intoxicated and they drink more, we normally cut them off. On Flatbush itself, there's a lot of interactions with people who have you know, issues of the past that actually sometimes transpire in the bar out of my control. Nothing much I could do on uh, pretty much on that side. As far as for the last any, same thing happens. If they call, they make a police report. We supply NYPD with the tape. There's tapes on outside, there's tapes inside, and there's tapes in the backyard. That is kind of my, you know, stopping gap in terms of telling people, hey, you're recorded in here. So any incident that happens, it will be presented to NYPD, right? Um, we don't have security. I mean, these are very isolated incidents that happen. I could, I, I could share the tapes easily with you guys for the guy who, say he got assaulted. The truth is he assaulted somebody first and the guy fought back. That's on tape that I can present to you guys anytime you want to see it, right? Um, the loss of the, in terms of people's cell phone being stolen, you know, we have signs up, please don't leave your personal effects around. People walk around in their establishment, they steal people's phones, they steal people's purses, they steal people's backpacks. I mean, is there, is there any mechanism to prevent that in establishment? Not really. Right, people leave their cell phones pretty much in their bar. They go to the bathroom, it's gone. They leave their purse in the bar, they go to the bathroom, it's gone. Right, it's pretty much just monitoring. But as I said before, these are all recorded incidents. By the time you walk on the flat bush, you're recorded. You come into the bar, you're recorded. You go to the backyard, you're recorded. Right, so there's a zero tolerance policy for that. But I mean, can I stop it 100%? Not really, I'll be honest with you guys. All right, so I'm going to turn over. Um floor to the other other committee and board members if anybody has any questions or wants to comment i know that um please please um you know the floor is yours if anybody wants to ask richard any questions i have a question sure sure rashida then and then i saw rich also wants to ask and i'll go after you great okay hi this is um rashida sadiq i've been on the board for the past six years, been on the committee committee for the last four years, and I was a committee chair at one point. Um, my question to you, I know you said you couldn't do it, you can't really do anything. Is there a reason you don't have security? I can't afford it. Okay. 
And have you ever had to security now checking vaccination cards from that aspect? And that's actually just literally stifling me from a from a, from the from a city perspective because it's literally just hiring somebody for 150 bucks a night to check a vaccination card and say go in. And have you ever had security at any point since you opened? Yeah, day one, pretty much. I'll say probably five or six years ago. But the crowd has changed so much since then, right? That the security wasn't really needed. Again, two 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 reports, pretty much of I would say you know assault. But again, there wasn't any filing of that particular, of, of, no criminal charges of that of those events. So I leave it up to pretty, you know what I'm saying, in terms of, I, I have no idea what transpired in verbally from that aspect and, and you know, cause that incident to happen, but I, we, have, we have it on, on tape. I mean, I just, I just found it, I'll play it for you guys in like two seconds when you get a chance. Okay, so just to clarify, when you initially applied for the application to the board, you, yep. were, you did have security, then at some point decided no longer have security, and now you just have security for vaccination. That's correct? Yep. That's not correct, no. So initial application, zero security. Okay. It's been there for six years now, zero security on my community board application. I don't, I don't, I don't have security. I have, I have recently applied security in the last three to four months. Uh, let's just call it a, a checkpoint at the front door for vaccination card. If it's security, it's great, but it's a checkpoint at the front door for, for thing. I don't have security because we have a lot of fighting and assaults happening in that space, right? That's not why I have security I, or a checkpoint at the door. This checkpoint at the door today is just for vaccination checks. I've never applied to have security. I never had the intention of having security in the bond flat bush for the last six years. Okay, just one more follow up. Um, have there been any incidents since you've added this person's checkpoint person in the last couple of months? It's only been three months and there hasn't been any accident incidents. But again, this is pretty much on the busy period, the security is here because of the volume of people in there. Monday night, bartenders normally check ID cards and vaccination cards because it's a slow night. It's 15, 20 people in there. He could afford to do that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Rich. I just want to say that I I, I do live um, not too far from 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 your establishment. And uh, from what I've noticed, there there's never been any incidences that I've seen. Um, I'm actually more bothered by some of the other surrounding uh, I've been here for several years now and uh, it seems that you have a, a pretty good establishment as far as uh, you know no instances occur on a daily basis when I walk past that's it Thank you, Rich. Kyra you asked you asked to speak and then afterwards um test please yes so um just to piggyback on the security point, because that's what I noticed after reviewing the police reports that were sent over, I too know about your establishment. Uh, it's right now, neighborhood. And uh, in addition to that, I looked at reviewing the application, and my question was going to be as well. It's you when it asks if you have security, it says only due to COVID. But I was just going to suggest that maybe you can consider uh, enlisting security at your establishment just to offset uh, you know the mindset that it might be a little um, unsafe at times for some of the patrons in the community thus the, all of the reports that have come in and also as a business owner I do uh, empathize I guess with you and, and other business owners and establishment because I know it would be hard for you to enlist another personnel However, in our community, everybody does need to see, uh, feel safe. Um, so I do think potentially having a security guard would work. Maybe someone that can actually be security and also be the checkpoint person for uh, checking the vaccination cards. I do also want to make one suggestion. Uh, reviewing the pictures also submitted with the application about your location. Because you do, ha you do have the ability to utilize the backyard space. I don't know if it's possible that some type of door or entry point can be developed for the backyard. There is a door there. Oh, there is no door? Yeah. It's always pretty much open because it's a free flow, right? It's pretty much as if you've been there before, it's kind of like, you know, there's two doors actually, there's a, a screen door. 
mm -hmm. morning and there is a because at night we have to walk off the backyard. So there's a security door and there's a screen door. So there's actually two doors there. Okay, so people can, patrons can enter from the backyard and just be there without going inside. That's what I was meant by. Oh, no. So so the flow is from the front door through the bar to the backyard. And that's what I was mm -hmm. actually attesting to before that, you know, the reason for security is especially in the weekend when we're really busy is, okay. you know, the law is pretty much if you're outside, you could be unvaccinated. Inside, you have to. Right? But there is no way for me to say, unless I put bands on somebody's hand or rip it off anyway, that somebody who's not going to come from the back door, backyard, who's not vaccinated inside because they have their friends inside. So that policing is where the problem is. So, uh, which leads, I was also too then going to make a suggestion like this. So if there was a way, and I'm sure it would be expensive or something it would cost, but a way to provide some type of entry point from the backyard. And also I was going to say something about bands, you know, to maybe band up anyone who's enjoying the backyard space, yep. you know, so that way they can't enter in. I think this is something you should investigate more because I definitely- well, I tried that. And all people okay. take the bands off their hands. Oh. Well, okay. And who's gonna police everybody <laughs> inside checking for bands when there's nobody at the door, because we have to really check at the door. You would have to hire another security guard would be my suggestion. Yeah, but in with a 30% decrease in revenue mm -hmm. because of the vaccination checks, it's almost impossible. Might as well I close my doors. Right. Let me be honest. Do you, have, Pastor, do you have any questions or comments? Yes, um, I, just, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, um, He's basically saying to us that that he cannot afford to have a full time security person. But you mentioned that the crowd was changing. Could you elaborate on that? What what did you mean by that? If I mean being on six cemetery flat was six years ago to today, it's night and day. Meaning what? Tell me what you mean. In terms of in terms of the you know the people that came in and you know they were demanding certain things you know from me then I mean I mean I, I, I'm going back I've been working with you know Vince, with Detective Martinos for years in terms of working with the NYPD you know simple things like okay is the music being played too loud you know is the crowd too you know too ruckus you know is there incidents being happening over and over again that's chronic right I mean. I haven't seen the police report for today, but I'll give, go back to six years ago. I had about 12 to 13 incidents on my police report. So when I say the crowd is changing, the crowd is no longer younger, it's more mature, right? right? People like this pretty much on the call that we're catering to. We're not catering to the 21 year old today who's going just the back to smoke and stuff like that, right? We're catering to a more mature crowd who want to go in and become a part of the community, right? We have groups that come in there pretty much five or six days for the week. Right, so when I say changing of a crowd, the crowd that we're catering to is not a younger crowd that we used to do before, right? This guy who actually got struck with a bottle over his head, he's 44 years old. He's not like a 21 year old, 22 year old fighting in the backyard. We're talking about grown people here, mm -hmm. right? So when I say the crowd is changing, it's changed from an age and maturity level in the last six years. Okay. Well, right. that's, that, that's interesting. What I wanted to, to suggest, you know, you mentioned several times that you work closely with Detective DiMartinos, who's now retired from the 71st Precinct Correct. for Community Correct. Affairs. And, and I'm not sure, maybe, you know, uh, Chairman Berman knows who's replaced him. Is I, there I, a way for you to have, since security is such a, a difficult thing for you at this time, is there a way for you to have a police car kind of uh, um, sitting or, or or loitering for a for a sig significant period of time uh, during what would be considered your heavy period. I'll give you a good example that I that call that happened with that assault. The cops took about thirty to forty minutes to get there. Right, the lowest priority on the list. Right. right, almost like an accident that's actually happened on that list. So the guy literally sat there, but you know, the ambulance came, but the cops came like way after. Not their fault. It's Friday night. They're super busy with other stuff. Right. Right. So it's almost impossible to have NYPD come out there and just sit. I mean, we're not having parties that we have a big floor of people coming out after. 
We're right. just talking two or three people, um, you know, exiting at, at, a, at a particular time. Um, and probably not for the pandemic happening, it might have been feasible, but there's two things happening right now. One is my crowd, as was before you guys join, uh, my regulars are probably 35% of them are not vaccinated. So they're not coming by. Yeah. So the revenue has decreased that amount. In comparison with actually having the higher security, you're almost at a break even point. I mean, I'll be honest with you guys, I would think quite a few times of just shutting the place. So I actually, okay. I actually met with NYPD today and the recommendation was not, not to support. They did not feel the establishment was like was necessarily an issue. They, there has been incidents there and we, we want to work on how to resolve it. But it, it wasn't like they said this place is bad news. They said that uh, we have to figure something out. So, so this is my suggestion. And I just want to something I want to address after you finish presenting. Who is the bartender? I have a general manager, Derek Warburg, and I have three bartenders that manage. On the right. So the law in New York State is really that if somebody's intoxicated, you yeah. can't serve them alcohol, correct? 100%. Just make, I, I, what I would suggest, do you have signage anywhere in your restaurant about that? You do. We, it's, it's, it's required by right. SLA. Doesn't mean that you have it. You, you have it. Yeah. So I would suggest that we, that you're, that we, we make sure your bartenders are trained on the, in this area and that you're, and there's enforcement, that you're on top of it. Your, bar, your bartenders know when somebody comes and intoxicated, they don't get a drink. So That's most it. of my bartenders go through a program called TIPS. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. That's actually a, a mandatory program. Well, not mandatory. It's a, it's a program that's assigned by the SLA. You pretty much go online and you go through in terms of determining how to read an ID card, determining how to look at an intoxicated bartender, uh, a patron, right? How to cut people off. So my bartenders have been bartending the manager for 22 years. Right, these are not like rookie guys. I'm picking up across the street. Most of my guys that work there have been in that establishment with an average period of five years plus. Right. So, but I know, but many bars in the neighborhood do not enforce this rule, even though it's it's law. So, what I'm suggesting is that you that you know you tell us because yep. we want to we want to be able to tell the community we we've, we've done our job and we've discussed and you're making changes. You tell us because the reports included people that, that were drunk when they came in, that you're going to make sure that you have a no tolerance for anybody who comes in drunk or becomes drunk in your establishment. They're not going to be served. There's a no tolerance for that. And I think that would. There, so, so there's a zero tolerance policy for that. The issue that I'll be honest with you that you have is like this. If I go down to Flatbush Zombie and I have four, two drinks. All right. And I walk over to Westbury Inn and I have, and I'm okay. When that other two drinks kick in and I have two more, that's when it pushes them over the edge. And that's what the bartenders are monitoring today because we do not have table service, right? So you have to walk up to the bartender and order your drink face to face, just like this. So that's the, that's the, that's the angle we're using to look at intoxicated people. The also issue you have is if you go to the bar and you pick up two beers for somebody else or two drinks for yourself, and you hand it to somebody who's a little over the edge, we don't see that person. You get what I'm saying? Right. That's the issue you're going to have. Let's say you're in a group, and one person out of five is at the edge, and that somebody from the group buys a, a round of drinks, so it's five, and give it to that person. You could push them over. Right. So, so one person comes and brings back to their friends, and you don't yeah, see Exactly. So, it's so, so this is actually, I'm working now on an environmental strategy, which I wanted to bring to the committee. Um, I, I, you know, ACES is offering some funding for media and my nonprofit is considering applying to do a media strategy to educate the community on um, the dangers of alcohol. When I met with different law enforcement agencies, I said, what's a project we could do in the neighborhood to educate people? What's a policy that's not really enforced that could really help out the community? And what I'm hearing from law enforcement is and from, from different community organizations that this policy of not serving somebody who comes in intoxicated, whether it's a, a liquor store, whether it's a bar, that the laws are not clear enough. To, it's really, you have discretion to decide whether the person is intoxicated or not. It's right. not clear. And I, want, and I, wanted, I wanted to hear you know, more from you and others, whether or not we, we want to go to the, to the legislator and have them have a, a more defined law and how it would help you and what some of the challenges are 
like what you just stated now, if one person comes to take alcohol and he brings it back to his table, so he could have somebody very drunk at his table Sure. And you don't see that person, and that person goes outside and, and whacks a bottle over somebody's head. Sure. And and the unfortunately, a lot of the crime in Crown Heights implies somebody either on some sort of substance, whether it's alcohol or something else. So this is something, again, like I wanted to pre present to the committee and partner with the committee. Do we want to take this on and try to educate the, com educate the community on the dangers of alcohol and whether or not there's something in the policy, the way it currently reads, that we could change to make it easier for bartenders and for liquor stores to enforce. I mean, it's the same thing like I've said before. I've seen people with my own eyes leave the bar, go down the block, buy liquor out of the liquor store, drink it, and come back in the bar and order a Coke because they don't want to pay the bar fees. Right. Right? I mean, and so I didn't even sell them the liquor. Cute. Okay, and the, I believe all of these scenarios as they are true. I've also seen where there are drunk patrons that are stumbling onto another bar that are stopped by their security guard before grant, being granted entry. And I just also would like to say, um, in the event that there's a way that the COVID, uh, the COVID person could have maintain like a hybrid position in terms of doing some type of security and or if you can but, offer but you see the issue with that is security guards are not trained to detect if somebody is over the limit or no. not their job uh, is to check ids okay check the co check the covid vaccination card mm -hmm. and make sure the place is secure right but as i said before you could have two or three drinks come into westbury and have one beer and go over the limit no, I agree with that. So, and also, so, and our jobs to understand is to make sure that we relay to the public that they are safe. And that's why we're having this meeting with you. And you right. just mentioned that we need you to also be able to present us effective ways of saying, this is how the problems in the past, and this is how I propose we can conquer them in the future. And with that being said, being also said, 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 job is to de-escalate and an occurring in any in, in event, in event, in event that right? So the fact of just having that personnel present is another way of reassuring the public safety community board, as well as the people of the community that, okay, in the event that something does go down, whether it's the mature 44 year old with the glass bottle, beer, the beer bottle, and or uh, some of the youngsters from yesteryear that were 21 and they used to come there and start stuff we at least have someone there that we can look to to say we need help. It's, it's, it's a great idea. After with Tessa and then Rashida. But financially, in the, after the pan COVID, the pandemic, I don't see it feasible today. I think it's something to be explored. Do you know on average, I probably kick out 10 to 15 people outside, out the bar every month because they bring bottles of liquor in their bags and drink it? I can't search their bags. Uh, but are they allowed to bring in? Are they no. allowed to bring it in? No. But people violate. Right. So I, mean, I personally just put a bullet for the answer. I could, I could, I could, I mean, I could, I could give you guys different scenarios. I'm not, I'm not saying security won't help. I'm not saying bartender training won't help, right? More, more of that. I'm just saying there's not one bullet, silver bullet that's going to solve all these issues. Pretty much dealing with the patrons that are there, moving into the neighborhood that are new, kicking out some of them, making them never come back, right? Because I'm not the only bar in the neighborhood having these issues, I'm pretty sure today, because I know most of the bar owners in the neighborhood today, they're all having the same issues, right? They're all having the same issues of people coming in to violate, right? Bringing their own liquor in, going down the store, buying their own liquor and coming back just to hang out with their friends, right? I, I mean, I don't know pretty much most of the bar neighbors, most of the bars in my neighborhood today, right? So the security is a great idea. Financially, it's a deterrent right now, especially because of the vaccination cards that I said before, because of the decrease in revenue. So, you know, I'll, I'll keep echoing this over and over because the restaurant industry start bar industry is not the breeding ground for COVID. The restaurant and bar industry has been punished over the last year as being the breeding ground for COVID.
but there's no evidence to say that the restaurant industry and the bar industry has been spreading COVID at 40% rate or 30% rate indoor or outdoor. There's no, there's no facts to back that up. We're just going based on the law. All right, Tessa, you had a question? Thank you. Richard. Yes, I um, I I hear what what uh, brother Richard is saying, and um, he's making sense. Uh, he's being honest. He's being uh, forthcoming to us. I just want to to let him know though that tell us something because we have to tell the wider board something. Yeah, I. I, I um. So so tell us tell us. Um, if you can, um, it's, it's a good idea. I will explore it. I will look into it. I will try to do it, even if it's just, you know, short term, meaning, you know, get over the holidays, which, which, you know, might be difficult with, you know, holiday parties and the like. I'll try to see if I could squeeze out something, get some security in. Um, when it comes to thefts, that, that just speaks to the the moral disfiber of, of human beings. I mean, you know, someone should be able to leave their cell phone and go to the restroom and come back. But you know, uh, you know, if, if a couple of, if cell phones and purse or a backpack got stolen, that's, that just speaks to the moral fiber of people. I don't even know if, if even if it's security, if you can avoid that. Um, the outside incident, um, you know, somebody felt strong and powerful because they had a few drinks and felt like starting a fight. Um, we, so we're not saying that you're responsible for what people do. All I'm saying is that you need to tell us something about what you will try to do to, to, so that we can make this palatable to the community. That's, that's it. That's what this is about. And I, we recognize that you're being mm -hmm. as forthcoming as you can be. Right. And really quickly before I, 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 I want to keep it. Um, Rashida has her hand raised. Let's try to raise her hand so that way everybody has the opportunity to ask questions. So, uh, Rashida had a question. Rashida? Um, yeah, actually, it's just a little bit again. I'm kind of going back and I've been listening to what um, Richard has been saying and I'm getting just a sense of I understand the costs, but we do have a situation where we have a report of incidents happening. So yes, the costs we have to take into consideration, but as a public um, safety board committee and also as a community board, you're coming before us to renew your license. Yes, we don't have the ultimate decision on it, but we have to give our feedback. And if we're just hearing, well, this is what's going on. I can't do anything. I can't do anything, but we need to say, Okay, even as Tessa, Tessa had said, a short-term period, you do have a security person, not a security, you have a person there that's checking for COVID and vaccinations. Maybe have them do additional training so they can be there. Sometimes just having the presence is there is deterrent enough. Yep. Um, and that's something that you can say you will look into long-term or short-term to see if there's a deterrent. Because if you look at the reports, the last couple of them have happened. And you know we, this, we have several renewals that come up before us and not all of them have clean slates, but a lot of them do. And since you're, I know your establishment, I know where it is on Flatbush Avenue. Um, we, I remember when I was the board, I'm sorry, the committee chair, and they had issues with Beekman Place, some incidents, and they came up with a plan. And that helped us going forward with saying, okay, now we have this plan in effect. So we have it on the record. So the next time when you come up with renewal, if there's more incidents, now we have a framework of what's been done since then. I'm 100% I'm, I'm, yeah, correct. I'm, I'm not making excuses, right? We know that. We know that. But, yeah. but I don't want to lie to you guys at the same time. And so say, don't. Say, Just say right? you're going to try. Just say I'm you're going to look into it <laughs> right. and try. So, that's, that's all we want to hear from you, so, Brother so Richard. Bear with me for one second on this. I didn't receive a police report, so I normally would answer them with a plan. I could show you my presentation that I always present to you guys for, for years, to the community board, and to this. So I'm actually going on memory in terms of the incidents that happened. There's, as far as I understand, there are two assaults. I could look into it to see what I could do more. The security I hire in the front, I can't train them. They're not my people. I have to hire a licensed security guard by law. So I can't train them. I'm not making an excuse. If I put my guy out there, it's a different story to handle the issues on Flatbush. What do you mean by law? You can, what, what you can't? A licensed security. You can't train him and, and, and you can't give him a basic training. 
and how somebody looks who's intoxicated and say not to let him in or to he call you and they, they rotate. I, I go to a security company. So you give, you have, when they come in in the, in the evening, you say, listen here, the law is we can't serve somebody intoxicated. If somebody comes in and looks drunk, please alert me and I will deal with it. Correct. So and you, you, you ask them to leave direct. the establishment. They, they do that by default. We're trying, we're, we're trying, to, we're trying to help you. So yeah, tell yeah, us yeah, yeah. what happens. I'm just, I just want to make sure I give you guys all the information. Let me, let me ask you a question. Tell me yes or no. Would you consider... Yes, yes, yes. I could definitely do that. consider asking your, whoever's checking for the COVID vaccine yeah. to keep their eye out for anybody who comes in that looks intoxicated and to alert you. Yes. And if you see that they look to be a potential a problem, you'll either remove them from the restaurant or from the establishment and you think that they're a danger, you'll alert NYPD. Yes, I could do that. That's yes, all you wanted to hear, that's brother. All I was saying. Say, yes, that's you're all. 20 minutes to get there, for yes. God's sakes. I want to make sure you, you know that I didn't have my dinner yet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask, is there anybody here that did not yet have a chance that's on the committee? Pamela Yard, I see you're here. Do you have anything to ask or to comment? Are there any other committee members or, or that are here that would like to ask a question and make a comment? Anybody from the community that wants to ask a question or make a comment? All right, so let's let's go to a vote. Can we have a? Um, does anybody want to recommend um, a letter of support? Do we 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 recommend the full board. I'm sorry. Do we recommend that the full board votes to provide a letter of support to renew the liquor license? Anybody want to make a motion? Um. So yes, Chairman uh, Berman, um, you, you said that NYPD said that the establishment wasn't a problem, but the patrons might might be. I and will, so I say, NYPD, they I spoke to them about right. the nation. They didn't seem to believe it wasn't an on the record conversation. It was off the record conversation. Right. They seem to believe that the establishment is at a place now where we have to oppose the license. They felt that if it's it, it, there has been some incidents there and the owner should do his best to, you know, to, like we said, to make sure nobody comes in there intoxicated, alert NYPD as soon as there's an issue and to see if this could res it will be resolved this way. They didn't feel we're at a point where we have to oppose it. That was my understanding from my conversation with NYPD. Okay. So, so is, is, so it's, so is, so that's the general sentiment. And after close to half an hour, we brother Richard seemed to be now, be inclined to say, and he was he was being forthright, so we, we 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 understand that he will try to do everything humanly possible, even with the decreased revenue, to 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 uh, keep intoxicated people out of the establishment and minimize uh, any NYPD involvement to the best of his ability. Is that true, Brother Richard? Minimize or if need be, maximize. <laughs> yes. Well, minimize incidents. Minimize incidents. Is that true, Brother Richard? Yes, it is. To the best okay. of your ability, so help you God. Yeah. <laughs> the best of my ability. Do don't, call, don't get God involved in this, Brother That's Richard. Exactly we just want to try. The best of my ability. <laughs> we just want you to try. Yes, best of my ability. Do we have a motion to support? So moved. A second. I have motion to support. All right, so we have Tessa made a motion to support Rich. A second to the motion. Um, Rashida, how do you vote? I vote yes, just with with concerns, but yes. All right, uh, Kyrie, how do you vote? I'll abstain. All right, um, Pamela Yard, how do you vote? We can't hear you. I'm going to abstain because I came on late. All right. So I, I vote yes. Vote. All right. So I vote yes as well. So it's, 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 that's three yeses and two abstentions. Did I get that right? So the motion passes. Um, we will bring your, you know, we will, we will, we will try to be as transparent as possible to the full board and, and brief them. And, and Richard, when, if we do come in front of the full board, we ready. We don't have to go through this again. You're going to make the effort and and um, you're going to do your best to uh, brief the whoever's checking the vaccine card to be you know alert and aware to look out for people that come in that may be under the influence of a substance of some sort. 
And if they're, if, if they're intoxicated or, you know, you're going to, you're going to ask them to leave or alert you to make an assessment, whether or not NYPD has to be involved. Um, I see we have here, uh, Karen from the DA's office. Would you like to say anything before we move on to the next, the next uh, item? No, no, I'm fine. Thank you. All right. So I, I touched on this briefly before when, when Richard was presenting and, you know, OASIS is now encouraging community organizations. I have a drug prevention program under OASIS and they're enc encouraging community organizations to make environmental strategies in the neighborhood. An environmental strategy basically means you take a policy as it relates to drugs or alcohol. You try to enforce that policy or, or change that policy. You try to advocate for that policy through media awareness and um, community support. You create a coalition of, of, of support and you, you know, you attempt to change community norms and in the interest of the community to, to educate people. And I was thinking to potentially um, do this under Operation Survival, I would ask the community board to, to partner with me. And after conversation, like I stated with law enforcement, some of the organizations involved with drug and alcohol in our neighborhood, it seemed that a policy which needs help and needs awareness and enforcement would be potentially this exact issue that just came before us. Um, what is considered an intoxicated person? At, at what point you know, does the bar stop serving them alcohol? Are local bo bars and liquor stores um, following the law and not serving people that are under the influence of, that, are, that are drunk when they come in? And uh, are bartenders trained? Is there a clear definition under the law of, of what's, you know, if, some, if somebody comes in, what, what would make them? How do you define an intoxicated person? How do you know if they're drunk? Who decides? How is it, you know, there, there, is, there is some definition based on their behaviors, but can somebody come into a bar and you could serve them 10 drinks and you could assume they're not intoxicated? Is there, is there a clear definition under the law? And if there isn't, can we advocate, you know, to, ha to have the law more defined? I'd love to hear some feedback from, 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 uh, from co committee members and, and uh, community members whether or not this is something you, you feel is needed and whether you would participate, be on board, and how we should go about this. I'm opening, you know, um, I'm turning it to the floor. If anybody wants to comment. Yeah, this is Rashida. Um, is it like a public service campaign or what exact, what, what's the framework? So the, the campaign would have several components. You would take a policy, let's say this policy of not serving alcohol to people that are intoxicated. Then we would um, we would have a component of a media strategy, which we would, educate the, we would educate the bartenders. We would get them on board, create a coalition of, of local stores and bartenders and community leaders. And then we would, um, we would um, do a media awareness campaign to the community about the dangers of alcohol. And then we would work with, whether it's the SLA to do checks at the local bars and with the bartenders to enforce the policy. And if we feel that this law and this policy could use some revision, we'd work with local legislators to potentially um, work, on, work on the law to change it and, and make it more clear and, and, and possibly uh, have a greater, if, if there's a need. I, I haven't read through the entire, uh, I haven't read through what's currently law now, but if we feel there's something that we could, uh, help, you know, make it better to help bartenders and liquor stores um, enforce this law, we'd work with legislators to, to change that as well. So I guess, I, mean, I don't know, did I answer your question? Yes, yes, so it's a part public service campaign, part educational events that are gonna happen with the bartenders and the bars in the neighborhood, in the area. Right, and I would, I would uh, apply for funding under my nonprofits which would give us probably uh, media enough to buy media media um, media ads and flyers and brochures and whatever we would need in terms of to spread awareness. I'd also reach out. To, we would reach out as a committee to local elected and see if we could get local elected on board as well. Okay. I mean, we could do, we could do this without funding as well. I feel, but if I could get this funding, then we have the option to buy ads and, and flyers and, and potentially make an event, an awareness event. If we don't have funding, we could just do it without funding as well. We, you know, we could just do it just with a committee and a coalition, but we just, you know, we would have to, you know, it all have to be volunteer. We would not be able to, 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 to you know, make an event or 
unless somebody wants to fundraise, I'm saying. I'm not sure, but yes, Tessa. We can't hear you, Tessa, you're on mute. I think it's a great idea. Um, I think we can um, even engender some support from um, public safety chairs on, on, on maybe board 17, maybe board three, you know, two or three of the surrounding boards that's close to us. I think it's a great initiative. I think it's, it's long overdue. I think it's a, it, it's a, it's a problem. Um, and I, I don't know if the industry would, would react adversely, but certainly from a, a public service perspective, as um, Sister Rashida indicated, um, I think it's necessary. Um, uh, and I think that it's, it's a great initiative and it could consume um, the work of the Public Safety Committee uh, going forward. And this would be something that if we can pull it off and make it happen for the benefit, not only of the board, but for the wider community. And if we can get support um, and get a legislator or two to, to, to support this, I think it has the potential for significant positive long-term and short-term effects. Thank you so much, Tessa. Uh, thank you, thank you. Hey, Richard, what do you think as, a, as an owner of an establishment? What do you think? Do you think that uh, people would get on board? You think this is something that I think, I, I think the first steps is to actually invite have have a, a monthly meeting with if you if you could with bar owners and try to correlate these problems together with a, with a bigger solution within with, you know within your boundary first. That's one. You know, bring them all in one meeting. You know, a quarter. Like let's just how I go to the SLA meeting with with the NYPD, and we learn from the SLA pretty much once a month. They have it in different precincts, as you know. And we learn from the SLA when they invite what's happening, what's new. Um, as I mentioned before, the TIPS program, um, it's voluntary today in terms of actually training bartenders. Um, should it be highly accessible um, to bartenders? Probably it should. I mean, I don't think a lot of people even know the program even exists. So how do you educate even bar owners to educate their bartenders that the TIPS program exists to, you know, in, in terms of working with the SLA in terms of what they want to see or what you guys want to see. And if it's a part of that program that already exists and the answer's already out there, but we just need to disseminate that information to bar owners, you know, in the community so they know of it and then they can better handle that ish those issues. Thank you, Richard. That's a great idea. Would you help us? It sounds uh, like a great idea, yes. Would you help us uh, network and, 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 and meet local, uh, but you said everybody knows each other. Would you be a part of yeah, I mean, what I'm saying is that just invite the bartenders to, you know, one of these meetings and make it mandatory so they can attend. I mean, act like it's mandatory so they can attend. It's going to be 30 <laughs> minutes at their time, right? And just have a SLA representative come on, the, you know, come on and just speak for like 15, 20 minutes. And or we could just give them the tips program. I'm going to put the tips program in the chat group here right now in a, in a couple of minutes, right? I don't and the chat. This is something the information that we disseminate to the owners and probably it's going to make an impact. But it has to start with the, with the, all the bar owners coming together with some kind of common problem that you guys are seeing because I come on here today, I'm just one bar owner. Next month, you have a next bar owner on here and information doesn't get passed through, right? I'm a part of a restaurant association and stuff like that, that they send this information out. But I don't, I don't think like a lot of bar owners or new bar owners that are trying their hand are aware that these things exist, right? They go pretty much just do the basic and they try to figure it out. It's really financial right now than it is preventative, right? Because after the pandemic, it's really about the numbers that they just making sure that you could survive, right? But I think having the, the program from the SLA, probably having a representative once a quarter will be great, but having all the bar owners together and, and, and you guys could kind of say, okay, these are the issues we're seeing in the community, day one, you know, with people being overserves. This is a possible solution with the TIPS program to train your bartenders up. And if it's if, if, if it's to be funded from a nonprofit, even better. It's like 20 bucks or something like that, right? But if it could be pro, pro, um, funded, group sessions, you get discounts. So why would all the bartenders that send their bartenders to one big group session to get trained? Probably a, a great place to start. What's 20 bucks to train a bartender? I'll, I'll look, I'm looking it up right now. It's not that much. Bear with me. Um, I'll send. It, I'll put it in the chat in this particular in, in this group, and then we could take it from there. The group discounts will actually give us way more um, discounts as you go, right? So the better, the more bartenders you have or owners you have, the better off we're going to be overall of sending somebody to this course. No different than getting a health department certificate, right? Twenty bucks, you know exactly what you need to do and how to store goods. 
Same thing could apply to tips. It's just, it's just a training session that needs to be handled, but at a, at, at a macro level, not at a, at a macro level. Very good feedback. Thank you, Richard. Yes, thank you. Um, P Pierre Albert, you have you wanted to comment? Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm visiting. I'm a community resident. Um, I also work in government, but I'm just here as a resident. Um, and I want to say that um, I agree with, with Richard. I, I think the public awareness campaign is great, but I think um, if you get buy-in by all of the, um, the bar owners, all of the restaurant owners before you launch it, I think that would be great as well, because as he alluded to, uh, I'm sure several businesses are, are facing that issue and trying to deal with it. So I think getting buy-in from all of them before launching the campaign would be great because they could even help out with that. That's just my two cents. No, I, we agree. Thank you so much for your input and thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Is there anybody? Yes, Pamela, you want um, to speak? You know, all, all, of your, all of your ideas sounds good, but you also have to look at the fact that everybody's tolerance level is different, number one, right? And then if you like try to impose all of these new laws on people, they're not gonna wanna come to the bar. They may not wanna come there. And I think really it depends on the clientele that you are that's out there that's coming to your establishment. You got to create like, you know, a certain kind of vibe like, oh, like you said, it's the older crowd that comes, right, Richard? So, I mean, you, I, mean yes, I think is. that's where it all starts at, the crowd that you are having to come to your location. The course is twenty three ninety nine per bartender. Oh wow, Sydney. So what I'm saying is, but you have to, you have people don't know it exists. Right. So we have to, we have to uh, educate people that it exists. And to right. Pamela's point, I think that's the way the law, law is currently writ, written. Richard maybe is more familiar, but I think that because everybody's tolerance is different, so therefore it's up to the discretion of the bartender to decide right. whether or not a person is drunk. And I, I think that. There are some benefits to that, but there are people that clearly come in who are intoxicated and, and or 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 there are people that get you know drunk in, in the bar. You give somebody 10 shots of, of Glenlivet or Lafroig, you're gonna be drunk, you know, chances are. So maybe I don't know that we have to revise the law. I don't know that we have to amend, but we definitely could educate people. And I think like as um Pierre said, I think if we have bond from all the bars. We'll also um, give Richard the, 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 you know, the encouragement and the support. It's not just, as you said, people won't go to bars. Everybody's going to bars. If they want to party, they're coming to party. If all the bars agree together to start enforcing this law and we work as a team, then I think that, you know, nobody's going to get a bad name or a bad, you know, if it's not just this one guy who's doing it. We try to get buy-in from everybody. I think you're going to be supporting each other. And, and, and it will make it easier for everybody to enforce. And I got to tell you that during the pandemic and post pandemic, we're going to see a rise in addiction and, and, and especially with alcohol, it's happening already and, and it, it's just starting. And this is really the time to do it because we're going to be saving lives. Families are being destroyed. Children's lives are being ruined. They're, they're, a lot of the crime happens after somebody takes, you know, a little too much to drink. Um, accidents happen the same way and we're not looking to punish people or to interfere with their life i think the state and the country is doing enough of that already we're looking to help people and um support them and educate them mm -hmm. and i think it's going to be a positive campaign just because we're talking about enforcement i don't think the campaign and the the mission and the and the and the, and the, the language we're going to use and the mission we're going to use is going to be negative about the, the you know about how the bars are going to we're going to take away your license if you serve you know people that are drunk. I think we're going to have a positive positive uh, component. Save a life, save a family, drink responsibly. I think we could do it in a way that, that will take into Pamela's concerns into account. At the same time, and, you know, do what we got to do and, and and get the message across. Tessa, was your hand raised? Or you already asked your question. Um. Um, my hand was raised, but I need to wait until we're done with, with the licensing to bring up a, another issue that's relevant to the public safety committee. So I'm going to wait. I'm going to stand down. 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna just summarize. I will continue looking into this 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 um, environmental uh, strategy, and I'll bring it back to the board when I have the committee. When I have something more, if I decide to move forward in my if my nonprofit decides to go forward, I'll let you know. Alternatively, even if I decide if I don't go forward myself, we could still do it as a committee, regardless. And I will reach out to other, um, you know, other. I'll reach out to the SLA and see what they think about this if it's done before. And I'll report back to the um, committee. I know somebody mentioned, I think it may have been Tessa or Rashida, that we should include other um, committees. Other, other public safety chairs, yes. I think that's a great idea. I think we should limit it to, um, we should figure out what area we should limit it to. So it's, it's more, you know, it's defined. Yeah, just well. two or three, maybe I 17. Also, all right, I, but I think we should wait until we know that we're going forward. And then when we, we, we reach out to the other community boards, and then we reach out to all the establishments. Instead of now, it's more in theory. When we decide we're going forward and we have a plan, then we should, we should reach out and include them once we have that plan. Does that make sense, Tessa? Are you okay with that? Yes, yes, that's fine. All right, so let's, so first of all, Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Please be in touch with the board office. I recommend that you do come to the general meeting because there were some, you know, issues with your establishment. I recommend you do come. And um, we want you, we hope, we, we wish you well, and we we hope that you, your business returns. It's not just a 35%, you have, a, you know, increased business in a safe manner, and people should drink responsibly, but you should be a, Incredibly wealthy, Richard. We give you a blessing. You should be incredibly wealthy. Thank you. And, so uh, yes, and and you should continue to service our community in a safe in a, in a safe Thank manner. You. And you should have success, and we should beat this pandemic. The information um, on the tips. Who would you like me to forward that to for the? Can you email it to the board office and ask them to share it with me. I'm sorry. Say it again. Can you email it to the board office and ask them to share it with me? Will do. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Tessa, would you like to, you said you wanted to bring something else up? Yes. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. So, so to, to you, uh, Chair Berman and R Rashida and, and Rich and, and Kyrie Allen and Pamela and the other committee uh, members and the community members, uh, someone was in touch with me and they were concerned about uh, uh, crime rates and incidents in the community. And one of the things that they brought to my attention and I told them that I would bring it to uh, the Public Safety Committee this evening is that they were wondering uh, whether or not um, we as a committee um, could share or invite the community, the new community affairs officer or and or the captain from the 74th pre precinct or do it ourselves and just give an overview of the crime statistics Maybe not every month, but every other month, just to just to um, advise the board of the landscape where there's pockets of maybe gang violence, uh, uptick in this, uh, downtrending that, whatever. I indicated to the individual who's a, another board member that um, you know the precinct council meeting is where all that statistical information is disseminated monthly. And so if board members in particular were interested in knowing that kind of thing, um, there's an option for them to go to that meeting. But um, he felt that it was, would also be a good thing and an important thing for the public safety committee to give an overview of what's trending crime-wise in the community and in within the district of board nine. So I told him I'll bring it to the committee, I'll bring it to your attention and get some feedback as to if that's feasible, if that's something we wanted to do every other month or what. First of all, Tessa, thank you so much for, for going out there and getting feedback. I, I think that we could do it. I think we should do it. I don't know how often we should do it, but I will tell you that I did meet with community affairs today and they did tell me there was a shooting, I think it was on October 27th. Um, yes. What happened was there were, there, there were two parents from the public school, I think it was on President and Washington. The kids had some kind of altercation and the parents came to resolve it or they weren't allowed into the school because of the vaccine card. The two dads went down the block to talk it out and one pulled the gun and shot the other one. So, something, along, something like that happened. Um, I think it's a great idea. 
and I think that we should um, invite uh, the community affairs to, to brief the community. I just don't know how often we should do it because it's also, you know, I, I don't want to make it that, you know, that they, they come every month. I think it's a lot, maybe quarterly we should do it. If you think um, maybe next, we should start maybe with next month, but definitely right. I think it's a great idea to um, bring um, the community affairs here. And I, I, I feel that they'll agree. I think that they want to interact with the community and they want to, um, we've done it in the past. We brought on the, you know, the new commanding officer when he first was, 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 was you know, got his job. And over the last two years, whenever there was a serious, we multiple times we brought on community affairs and, and other people from the police department. But I, I Tess, I really think it's a great idea. And I will um, reach out. If you remind me tomorrow, I will reach out to NYPD and invite them for next month. Okay, so could could we hear from Pamela or Kyrie or Rashida? Or and Rashida Rick? has her hand raised. So let's 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 hear from let's go down the line. Yeah. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, I definitely and actually I was gonna bring this up as well, um, Tessa. So that glad that you did it. Um, I know when I was the we, we used to have the NCOs come and um, notify us about when they're having their meetings as well. So maybe that's something that can be put back in that either uh, um, you know, for Khalid and them to once again put into the, the when they're having the notices go out every week when the NCO meetings are. Um, I think maybe definitely quarterly, we should have something from either the NCOs or the community affairs based on what's the what, what's been going on in the community because there definitely has been an uptick. Um, I know Diana Richardson, Zel Nomari, they've had recently a, um, a march over here, which um, I think it was last week. Um, so I think we need to also try to find out how we can get involved as a community board or as a public sa safety committee um, or what we can do because I mean, Hawthorne, we know is a big, um, is, a, is, is a block that has come to a lot of attention, Northstrand over here. Um, so I think once again, just reiterating, I hate that we always just keep on saying with the SLA licensing where we are public safety and we have had large public safety issues in the community that needs to be addressed. Thank you, Rashida. Kyrie? Yes, uh, I want to say first of thanks to Rashida, Tessa, everyone here. And in fact, that was the reason, one of the main reasons I was interested in joining this particular commi committee is public safety with a huge focus on crime rate that is going on in our area, but more so an open dialogue. Uh, connection or some type of communication and ongoing communication. I don't think it should be quarterly with a representative from the police department. And um, so I actually thought this is a great idea. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be once a month. I don't think it's bad. I don't know if it's maybe we ask if a representative or we extend an open invitation to attend every meeting. And, and maybe one, a quarter, once a month, I think we, as a public safety committee, owe it to our community to at least once a month give them some updates on some different issues and or establish, even if it's updates via social media, or if not directly with our committee meetings, we need to do something. And I do think this is a great idea to get them involved. Thank you. They and are they invited to meet but... Uh... They will come usually when they're encouraged to come or they're told it's important. But maybe, maybe we could work with 71st to um, give us a monthly update for the office to send out to the community. That's then, right, Rabbi. Yep. And then Absolutely. maybe we come on quarterly or when there's a major, when something happens like a big incident or something, yeah. we could bring them on. No, no, we, I'm we just don't concerned want to come every month. It's not going to happen just because, just because of the way, the way of the world and the way of the board. We don't want them to come when there's trouble only. We want them to come quarterly and just update the board as to what's happening. And perhaps they, they um, whatever their monthly statistic, newsletter, important, whatever, if they could get that to the board, then we could have it sent out as part of the public safety, public service. Great, so right. um, I'll reach out to, to, to Mike and see, see what they could do about that. 
Does Pamela have anything to say, Pamela? Rich? Um, yeah, I agree with you that we should have it quarterly or monthly because, I mean, you need to like nip stuff in the butt before it happens. Don't wait until something happens and then have them come out. And also, I think they should be more involved with um, block associations, that they should attend the block association meetings and um, give the output to help people. It's a very good point, Pamela. And I think, uh, I think more you'd get more involvement if you have people that understand who to contact for their block association. So if we as an organization can and provide that to the rest of the community and everybody knows who to go to. That's helpful for them. Who was just talking, Kyra? Is that you? No, that was no, that Rich. was Rich. Oh, and I agree. That was Rich. The point he was Rich, making. Maybe do you know is there a way we could get a list of, of block associations? I don't think we have a list of actually yeah I the board, know the board travelers. Well, the, the, the list is very outdated because I remember wow. bringing this up and they were trying to, that was one of the incentives. So maybe we can bring it up to our new, um, what's Dante? That's a project that they can put together because the last time they tried to, it was very far. Some of the, some of the block associations were no longer active. So I'm, and this was pre pandemic, maybe the same, like two, early 2020. So I doubt if anything happened during that time of updating that list. Um, the only other thing I would say is that, remember we have our NCOs that I know during the pandemic that kind of probably went to this wayside as far as their meetings. I think they started having in-person meetings. They never really did a Zoom. So maybe we can contact and find out when are the NCO, which NCOs and neighborhood community officers they have them by sections and every section monthly, they're supposed to be having meetings. So I'm not sure if they do their monthly ones now via Zoom or what's been happening, but that's also a good way for contact because I remember it was just easy to contact your NCO and that's another instead of 911 or 311 and they will be able to get you in touch with somebody directly as well. So Rashida, is it possible for, for the NCO that's assigned to, to 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 our area in the board to to board. come to to come to the uh, come to the board meeting and, and and update the board as to what's happening. Yeah, Criminal I mean, I remember people. inviting them, and they used to come. So yeah, I think we definitely that's what There's they do. More than one. It's yes, yeah, four sections: one. A, B, C, and D. Right. It's there. Just, there's, there's eight. Is it E? Okay. But could one of them, that sounds like five months to me, if one, one, one of them coming a month, that's five months right there. Oh, you want, we should bring a different NCO every month? Yes, that's five. If there's A, B, C, D, and E, that's five months uh, worth of reports. So the same person don't have to, A don't have to come every month. A comes, B, C, right. D, and then if, if C is not ready, we go to D and then we double back to C, you know. All we got to do is keep track of it, but make sure somebody comes okay, every the month. NCO, the NCOs may not be familiar with like, like community affairs really we could do their research and, and look at the full neighborhood. The NCOs are only going to be familiar with their direct, whatever, eight blocks or whatever it is, six blocks. But I think well, it's that, a great that's, idea. It doesn't matter as long as somebody comes every month and update the board as to what's happening. I think yeah. since we all agree it's a, it's a valuable idea, I think we need to, we need to put it in motion. That's Sooner crazy. rather than later. So let's, why don't we bring a mic next month and maybe the commanding officer and we'll ask him to coordinate every other month going forward another NCO to come. Absolutely. Whatever, what, not labor intensive. We're not looking to labor intensive. We're looking to serve. We're looking to serve the public. We're looking to serve the community, but we're not looking for labor intensive work. Mm -hmm. well, well, thank you, uh, Tess, for bringing it up and thank Thank you, Rashid, and everybody else that gave input, and um, to all the new to new committee members and board members. I'm very happy we had a quorum tonight, and we had a, a great. I, I feel like a productive meeting where we we didn't we did not waste time and we were focused. And it seems like we're going to be doing a lot of great things this year and positive change. And it's an honor to, 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 to um, serve with you. And if anybody has any closing remarks, please uh, make them now so we could end the meeting. Um, yes, Rabbi, it's me again. Rabbi? Sure. Yes, yes. We're all here. Did um did uh did did we need a vice chair of this committee? Why not? I think we should have a vice chair, absolutely. 
Okay, I nominate Rashida Sadiq. I second. Can How I did second? I know you were going to say that, Tessa? <laughs> no, you didn't, because you, you can't read my mind, damn it. And I'm hungry because I haven't <laughs> had dinner. So you definitely can't read my mind. I don't know. If I'm, am I a lot of seconds from the, the chair? I'm not sure I'm a lot of seconds. Am I? Yo, tell Kyrie to second this. So Kyrie second this. <laughs> right. Unless Kyrie sure. wants, tell I, Kyrie to second this, because Rashida got experience. <laughs> I agree. I'm also hungry. Okay. So, well, first and foremost, I would love to second this because I'm going to mark to be here in the long run uh, and next year in the Eastern community. However, on the experience tip, I have experience in the real world, as we all do. And how would I ever get experience if never given the opportunity, any board members moving forward? So I just want to put that out there as well. Thank you, Brother Allen. We'll keep you in mind. We'll find work for you to do. Don't worry about it. <laughs> All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Mm -hmm. uh, any, uh, any, any, anyone opposed? Mazel tov, Rashid, on being the vice chair and uh, being such an important member of this committee. And uh, I think we yeah. should close the meeting. How about this? Before we close the meeting, uh, Rashida, who's the vice chair, why don't you close the meeting? Thank you. Wait, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, Tesla, what's your, what are you in this, in this committee? He's committee? <laughs> hungry. Calls us to task. Well, 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 who said hungry? The person who said hungry is telling the truth. Okay, so, <laughs> so is, is it Pamela? Yes. Yeah, Pamela, I'm, I am, for the record, the either the first or the second longest serving person on the board that's 25 years plus uh -huh. i'm not sure that's important anything in the world but you know i thought i'd say it um and uh and i this is my second year in public safety i, I never liked public safety i was always a member of health and social services and you know youth and education and those you know those kinds of committees because I'm a social worker by profession. So when they put me in, in public safety last year, I almost had a stroke, but I decided not to have a stroke. <laughs> I just came to the public service committee and, um, and I enjoyed working with Rabbi Berman and, and um, Yankee Pearson and Rashida. I think we were the three or four most consistent members. And um, so when this year, when they didn't ask my opinion or consider what I wanted, which was transportation, and they put me back on public safety. Here I am, girl. That's it. Oh, okay. You know something? I think they mixed you up with Pearson because Pearson was put on transportation and he never asked for anything. And they told me, yes, they may have mixed you up with Yankee. Well, I'm glad Tess is here. I'm glad Tess is here. I'm glad everyone's here. And and if I may, I don't know, my, you know, look before I'm having I, 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 here, makes yeah, I'm, I'm glad Kyrie and Pamela and Rich is here. Okay, we got three more voices. Are we all here? I was still? just going to say that. You know, I just wanted to say hi <laughs> and thank you for all of you all service thus far. And and I'm so grateful and humbled to be here. And anybody else? Yeah. I just want to say I'm glad to see all the new members and I'm looking forward. Well, we're all looking forward to another productive year. And as I said, once again, just reiterating, we are really want to, yes, SS, SLA licenses are a good part of what we do, but we once again are focused on our community and we do have a lot of issues that we need to address. And I look forward to getting us to that and sharing information and making sure that the public is kept safe. Good. Thank you. Okay. Could, could, could I say one more thing, please, Rabbi? Of course. Could I say one more thing? Of course, of course. Yes. Could you could you put it have it official? Because you know we we have to show up to other committees on the board and we have to act like we got it going on. Could we have it officially put your name as chair and and and, and Rashida as vice chair? You know we got to upgrade. So it's, I want it just official mm -hmm. when 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 emails go out when when our report go out. I want to see. Chair and vice chair. You're saying on, our, that, on, our, on, our, on our minutes. Oh, on our minutes, yes. I, I, I want to see it officially on there. So we look like we upgraded from one year to the next. A hundred percent. And it should be there official. And I think that uh, we actually voted on it. So it's it's not just official, it's 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 board policy. Good. Yeah. All right. Thank you all for thank coming you, everyone. tonight. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.
Good night.